Throughout the Bible, we see so many things um, the Bible talks about, um, and the Bible educates us in it, and the Bible um, gives an insight for us. And uh, one of the things that Bible talks about is also um, is food. It talks about food a lot. If you uh, carefully uh, pay attention to the Bible, uh, throughout the Bible you see Bible talking a lot about food. And uh, if you look at us, all the things that happen in our lives kind of revolve around food. You know, the first time I saw my, my wife and my father-in-law were discussing, we, were, we just ate lunch and we are stuffed to the gills and they are discussing about what they should eat for dinner. That was the last thing I want to talk about, but they are happy to discuss about it, about the food, what they should be eating dinner. So that was an impressive thing for me. It's like, okay, these are my kind of people. I like them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're still talking. The food has so much of an influence in us and around us. Um, the same thing is true in the Bible. Bible talks a lot about food. And of course, there is the spiritual food, there is the physical food that Bible talks about, all these the, uh, the, the different things. And along with food also comes legalization. Along with anything, there is legalization. They legalize things. Um, food is one of the topics that we see in the society right now is being legalized left and right. Is being like, oh, why are you eating that? You shouldn't be eating this. You shouldn't be eating that. This whole thing is is running us. You know, if you are eating uh, uh, this product, you are a bad person. If you are eating, no, 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 no. The Bible has something to say about such kind of stuff. Jesus also says some things about it. I just want to talk something about it as we go through it. There is something that I believe God has placed for us. That, that would really help us with the journey that God has put ahead of us. There is an eating that is happening around us. Amen? Yeah. There is an eating that is happening with us. We eat. Anybody here that doesn't eat? You know, we all eat. There is a purpose for it. There is a purpose that God has created, how the machine works in us. I mean, like... Uh, um, there, is, there is a statement, I'll, I like it so much. The most expensive machine on this earth is human body. The way it processes things, the way it functions, the way it, it uh, uh, dissects, bisects, everything it does, it's just amazing. No other machine can do what it does. If you look at the computers or anything like that, they, get, they are limited only to a certain things. Maybe they are good with numbers. They are good with certain things. But whereas human body, it can do so many things. So many things. That's, that's one of the most expensive machines you can ever come across. And also the most complicated. The brain that we have is very complicated that even for us to fathom and wrap our head around it is not easy. It's not easy. It is, and uh, that's one of the reasons even the devil attacks those kinds of things so much. So we can never reach the full potential of us. So we can never go to the heights that God has created us to. So it is always trying to diminish us. You know, it is always trying to uh, bring stress into our lives, the, the bad stress into our lives. And, and, and because of that, we see our lives being distorted and we see our lives being crumbled and all those kinds of things are happening around us. And as a matter of fact, the, the mental pressure that we are in as a society right now is higher, is, is higher than this this world may have ever seen the pressure that we are in. Even the people that lived under depression may not have been under this kind of pressure that we are in. Is it because we are exposed too much? Or is it because of the food that we eat? Is it because of the godlessness that is being increasing? There are so many factors that work for us to consider. But if you look at it, even in the book of Genesis, the very first Sin is around food. 
what they have eaten. The food is available there, but it didn't make any difference until it was eaten. Once that was eaten, it changed. Once that was consumed, the dimensions were changed. Everything, the world was changed. So what I'm trying to say there, this is a small statement. The food that we have, we eat, is something that could be uh, used also by the devil. That eating process is something that the devil can use to destroy our life. Um, but uh, even even through the New Testament, many times people talk about, maybe ask the question, oh, can I eat this food? Can I eat that food? The food that is offered to the idols, can I eat it? <coughs> Excuse me. The food that is offered to this thing, can I eat that? Can I eat meat? Can I eat this? All these questions. And Paul, uh, even to us, in one place he writes that, oh, you shouldn't eat the food that was offered to the idols. And on the other side, on the other time, he says, oh, it's okay, eat it. Which one is right? You know, the best, the, the, the best answer I have uh, ever come across is this. There are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Which gift is more powerful? Whatever the gift you need then. That is the most powerful. You need the spirit of faith. That is the most powerful at that hour. So the same thing applies throughout the Bible we see. It is not about legalizing the text or legalizing things, but it is about how it applies into our lives, how it works into our lives. We have to always consider. So the title of my message today is That Which Was Eaten. That Which Was Eaten. After it is eaten, it goes through stages. Anything we eat, until we eat, we don't have any uh, problem with it, but once we eat it, if you are eating uh, 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 something that may uh, affect your body badly, then you will see the consequences of it. You know, anytime I, ser uh, uh, I serve the spicy food to people, <coughs> sometimes they don't want to eat because it is too spicy going in. But when they eat it, it works magic in their lives and even in the mornings. But that... <laughs> Because it was eaten. It didn't make any difference in their lives until it was eaten. So well, it means there's a stage that it is going through. There is a process it is going to go through. Bible talks, Jesus talks, Jesus has come across a similar situation about eating. Let's go with me to the book of Mark, 7th chapter. The Gospel according to St. Mark, 7th chapter, starting from verse 1. Mark 7, 1. <coughs> then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, him being Jesus, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat the bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Um, um, for, for the Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come uh, from the marketplace, they do not eat un unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold uh, 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 and hold like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Um, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? There is a tradition that was going on, and Jesus and his disciples broke the tradition. His disciples broke the tradition. So everybody came to him asking him, why? Why would you let your disciples do this thing? Why are they breaking? They found fault in it. So this is another thing I want, just a side note. If you want to find fault, you can find fault. It doesn't matter who that person is. If you really want to find fault, you can find fault. 
the car, the text of it, you know, the statement will make uh, proper sense if you look at Jesus' life. On one side, the one who has the authority to put him to death, he says, I don't find any fault with him. I find no fault with him. But whereas the, the high priest and everybody is like, kill him. This guy deserves to die. So on one side, people are finding fault. On one side, people are not finding fault. So what I'm trying to say is, don't just get crumbled under this pressure that someone may not like you. It is inevitable that someone out there hates you. Amen? It's okay. The more we realize it, we stop pursuing our journey to please people. Our call is not to please people, rather to please the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Our call never was dedicated toward people. It is about the King. It is about the one that called you. The one that called you is also faithful. And that our faithfulness should be toward the one that has called you. We need to stop worrying about what people might think about you. What this person is looking at you. They always try to find faults about you. It's easy. I can find thousand and faults with my wife. She can find probably 2001 faults with me. And finding faults for many people, that's a mission for them. That's all they do. What is this person wrong at? What is this person breaking? What is this person failing at? This is all they do. But that is not what God has created us to be. What does the Bible say? Love covers multiple sins. Multitudes. Love covers multiple sins. When we are walking in this love, our job is to cover not for us to find faults. We are living in a time and age where it is always about, oh, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. People are keeping accounts. Even before they enter into marriage, they are keeping an account that, okay, if you break this thing, I'm getting out. We, we, we are always looking at things. Look, let me look at this thing legalistic. That is what we are doing and that is what we are living around us. And it is uh, um, no different during Jesus' time. The same thing happened to Jesus. And when Jesus saw this thing, he answered and said to them, sixth verse, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. And he goes on and says those things. And in the 12th verse he says, Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down. And many such things you do. <clears throat> the conflict here was a man-made tradition versus the word of God. And in the midst of all these things, don't forget the component that we are talking about is the food. Food being evil. Now Jesus is coming to that place where he can talk about it. And he says, um, 15th verse, There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? 
<clears throat> do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? Has a question. And he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? So he is giving a, a, a distinction here about the food. He says, okay, he eats it, he eliminates it. But there are other things that could change someone's life, that could change someone's someone's future, that could change that person's uh, uh, um, course of life. Everything can change just like that. And when 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 Jesus was addressing that situation, he said, "Hey, this food that is eaten is getting eliminated. Don't worry about it." Don't worry about it. There are more weighty matters that are going to affect your life. So that there also it should give us a liberty and a freedom that let us not legalize food. Let us not get into the legalization of the food. And, and I found out many, many, many years ago, it's like, you know, something that is good for someone else's body is not good for me. God has created my body so uniquely and we find out every day that, okay, every body is unique. Every body type is unique. The blood type and everything has an effect on what you eat and how much you eat. It makes, it makes or breaks you. There is a, there is that, that, that is, that is happening in your life. So, uh, uh, something that is, that is so unique and something that can change from person to person. Let us not try to build a law around it. Amen. Amen. But that's not it. That's not where I am going. I'm going at some point here. The food that was eaten is consumed. God is okay with it. Jesus was okay with it in this text. But there comes places. There comes places that eating goes something different. The eating that the Bible talks about is something different. Let's go to the book of Job. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 1. <coughs> Starting from verse 2. Job, the book of Job, chapter 1. Starting from verse 2. It reads like this. Hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days? Or even in the days of your father? Fathers, tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children. And their children another generation. What the chewing locust left... The swarming locust has eaten. And what the sw swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. It talks about these locusts that were destroying their land. The food they are supposed to eat is becoming the food of these locusts. There are four different locusts that this, this passage is talking about. The first one ate something and left. The chewing locust ate something and left. That which was left by the chewing locust was eaten by the swarming locust. Next came another phase. And that phase he ate everything that is supposed to be your food. That is supposed to be the food of Israel. That is supposed to be the food of the believer. And that food is being eaten by something else. Something else is coming and eating it away. And then comes another thing. The, the crawling locust has eaten that which was left by the swarming locust. And then that which was left by the crawling locust, the consuming locust has eaten. There are four stages, four groups. One after another, one after another, one after another was eating. The, the thing is... Eating, eating, eating. Uh, what they were talking, what, what, it, what it was talking here is that which was supposed to be that person's food or our food is being eaten. 
threaten by foreign forces. And maybe I can simplify this from a spiritual point of, uh, of view, that which is supposed to be our food, that which is supposed to be the food of the children, is being eaten by these demons. That which is supposed to be your property is being eaten by someone else. You know, the thief has only one plan. He says his plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his plan. He is coming in stages. We thought this was over when the first locusts have eaten. We thought it was over. But no, no, no. Then comes another locust and that was chewing it up. And then we thought, okay, maybe I endured this thing. Maybe I endured the second stage. And then comes, there is another stage, another group that have come. And they started eating it. Maybe I can live off of this thing. You know, we, we, we sometimes we like, you know, if only I can have a small break. I'm not asking for a big thing. I just need a pause. I just need a pause. Sometimes we get attacked after, after, attack after attack, attack after attack. Thing after thing is going against us, not for us. That's exactly what is happening in this passage. That which is supposed to be your food is being eaten by these foreign entities. That is not why you worked hard. That is not why you dug the hole. That is not why you sweat. That is not why you did all that you have done. You did those things so that you would reap the labor of your hands. The Bible says that. That you, a laborer is worthy of wages. Yet there are nothing to be paid. Because everything is eaten. The stages, the attacks, sometimes the state of mind, sometimes the state of mind gets chewed. It starts with something. We're like, okay, we were pushing that aside, we will still continue. Then then comes another thing that chews up. And then we're like, okay, let me push this and let's push. And as it, this thing continues to eat and eat and eat one after another, that is eating us. Unfortunately, many Christians doesn't even recognize they are being eaten away. Many believers don't even recognize that they are being eaten away. Their thought process is being uh, corrupted. Their thought process is destroyed because the locusts have eaten. And, and, and many times this, this eating is happening in the financial realm. The, the finances that's supposed to be helping you, helping you build yourself, helping you build your family, helping you build the body of Christ, helping you be that person that will be ready to give in time and on time. But those finances, no matter what you do, can only go so far. <coughs> Sometimes that is happening. And sometimes the spiritual growth, we can only grow so much. We are going to a level one. We, we are going and we, the next thing is, there comes some attack. The devil tries to tell you, hey, you are lost, you are destroyed. Look at this person. Look at these people. Look at what has what have been done to you. The more it is doing, what is it doing? It is chewing your feet. There are many things in my life I thought were chewed out. I thought there is no, it's over, it's game over. I thought my dreams were chewed. No longer I'll be able to live in those dreams. No longer those dreams will come to pass. I have seen that right in front of me, my dream of being someone is destroyed right in front of me. And as a matter of fact, I was the willing participant in destroying my dream. In destroying my desire, my, my thing of seeing this future, my vision that was crumbling right in front of my eyes. And I stood at it and I looked at it helpless. 
And that's one of the reasons I even contemplated suicide because I couldn't see my dreams anymore. They were eaten. They were eaten. The possibilities of my dream are, are thinning by the day. And I never thought I would ever live in the land of the living. I thought it is over. And the same thing is coming here. There are many things that are coming at you. Whether you recognize it or realize it or not. There are many things that are coming at you to eat you alive. Or to eat your future alive. The, to eat that which belongs to you, whether it is your children, whether it is your family, whether it is uh, your, your business, whether it is your future. The devil has a plan. The devil has these locusts lined up to chew it up. As a matter of fact, in many cases, we already got chewed. We already got chewed. Thank God it doesn't end there. The book doesn't end there. Thank God there is something else that God has to offer for us. The same Joel that the Bible talks about. If you go back to the second chapter of Joel. The same uh, Joel second chapter. Starting from verse 21 it reads like this. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. For the Lord has done marvelous things. How can you talk about marvelous things when your food is eaten away? That is not a marvelous thing. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures and uh, are springing up and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the wine yield their strength. Be glad then you children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully. He will also rain to come down for you. The former rain and the later rain in the first month. He is changing something here, the dimensions, he is changing some dimension. You know, if you want a harvest, there has to be rain. Now, the God, what God is changing here is he is changing the rain. The former rain and the later rain. I'm going to bring them both at the same time. I'm bringing them all together. I'm bringing them to now place. God is in the business of now. In this now, what he is doing is the threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the wax shall overflow with new wine and oil. And so I will restore to you. So I will restore to you the ears that the swarming locusts have eaten Glory be to God. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust. The my great army which I sent among you. And then he says, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Hallelujah. The same locusts that have eaten your food, now God is declaring a war against them. Your God, the God that you serve, the God you adore, the God you worship, the same God is now declaring a war against something that has eaten the life from you. Something that has taken the time from you. The years that you were under this pressure. The years that you were under the influence. Which destroyed your future. Which destroyed your dream. Which destroyed your vision. Is now being restored in the name of Jesus. The God, that which was eaten, we thought it has come to an end. It is over. I can't get them back. But bless God, God is 
restoring things that which was eaten. In the book of Revelation, he says the sea has to release the dead. Everything we thought was over is not over. That's why I can boldly say this thing. It is not over until the Lord says it is over. Until the Lord your God says it is over, it is not over. There is a plan even when it is completely eaten. Even when it looks hopeless. Even when it seems like there is nothing that you can get out of it. God still has a plan of restoration for you and me. That exactly he knows exactly what was eaten. He knows exactly what was taken away. Psalmist writes it so well in, this, in Psalm 56, 8. <coughs> Psalm 56, 8 reads like this. We will come back to the Joel again. <clears throat> you number my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Are they not in your book? He numbered. He numbered my wanderings. He put my tears in his bottle. He has an account of every single moment that was taken away from you. Every single thing that which belongs to you that has been taken away from you. But now God is calling us to believe in him. Trust in him as the God of restoration. When I saw myself as a young person in front of me, my dream is crumbling. My dream is destroyed. I gave up on my dream. But God did not give up on my dream. There was a time God tells me, come on, it is time for you to get here. And I am like, Lord, I thought I was all lost. This was lost. This was a past cause. And I can't do anything about this thing. He says, I'm going to restore to you all the things that have been destroyed by these locusts. I'm going to give everything back to you. And I was jumping up in joy, jumping up in this day, great delight. And what he did was he not only gave those things back, how did he give it back to me? What that which I could accomplish in 10 years, he was able to bring me to a fast path. On that path, I was able to accomplish the same thing that may have taken 10 years. I was able to accomplish in two years. Amen. The God of restoration. I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to present us. I want us to be believing this God this year. This is a year of restoration. Can somebody shout amen? amen. This is a year of restoration in the name of Jesus. Every single thing that has been stolen from you, you think the years of peace were taken away from you. You think the years of joy were taken away from you. You think the life that you should have lived, didn't live. Those things are getting restored right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is time that we worship him, the God of restoration, the God of restoration, the God who is bringing back to the original, the God who is bringing back to life, the God who is giving you back that which was eaten by the locusts. Amen. Whatever is eaten is not if it belongs to you, his child is not going to go to the elimination process until you let it. God is not going to let that die. God is not going to let that go away from you because he knows the children's food is for children. Remember Jesus says, this is the food of the children. I can't throw it to anybody. And that Syrophoenician woman says, even the dogs can eat from the table. I'm here to tell you that we belong at the table. And when we belong at the table, there is nothing that cannot be restored back to you. Every single thing you lost, the honor, the dignity, the pride, the job, the money, the health, every single thing has to be restored. There is a command that has been sent out by God that we 
which the sea has taken, that which the land has taken, that which the fire has taken, has to come back in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It has to come back. Oh, what would you do with the command? Line up with it. Line up with it. I serve the God of restoration. I serve the God of restoration. There is nothing that has gone waste. He knows every tear that has been coming from your eyes. He knows every single moment that you spent lonely. He knows how hard it is for you to let go. He knows how hard it is for you to live through that. He knows the dark time. He knows that lonely moment. He knows the cry. He knows the prayer. He knows the worry. He knows the rejection. He knows the dejection. He knows the moments of depression. He knows the moments of oppression. He knows. Not only he knows it, he ends it with a big bang in the book of Revelation, he says. Let's go there, book of Revelation, 7th chapter. Book of Revelation, 7th chapter. This time I think I got it right. Book of Revelation, 7th chapter, starting at verse 16. <coughs> they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water. Hallelujah. Living fountains of water is no more dead things, man. The dead thing, when it touches the living waters, it becomes alive. And God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Every tear. Not some. Every tear. He knows the account of every tear you shed. Every cry you cried. Every morning you did. He knows those things. But now he says it is time. For those things to be restored. In the name of Jesus. I don't know about you. It is restoration time. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I want us to get excited about this thing. I want us to start bowing before this king of restoration. He restores. I even want to believe for us the restoration that God gave to Job. He restored not only that which was lost. He restored double fold. He restored double fold. He says in the book of Joel, I'm going to restore everything to you. The swarming locusts have eaten. The consuming locusts have even eaten. Any of these, these parasites, whatever the parasite may be, I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give it back to you. I think I believe God is challenging us today. Can you believe me? Can you believe me that I can give it back to you? Yeah. I one day expanded myself in believing that God will give back to me the dream that I lost. Today I am living in that dream that I dreamt of. I'm living in that dream. My dream is this. In, I'm, I'm being very, very uh, candid here. My dream as a young, young person was to be able to come to the U.S. and live. Today I'm not only living in, a, in the U.S., I am a citizen in the United States of America. Amen. There are still my friends that are out there. They couldn't even, they've been working, they've been working, they've been doing education. They haven't become the citizen yet. But bless God, God, I'm telling you, man, the ears the locusts have eaten, he restored them to me. He gave them back to me. Not only he gave those years back to me. He gave me my wonderful wife. He gave me my wonderful son. He gave me my wonderful daughter. And he gave me all of you. This is the God of restoration that we serve. Not a God who forgets what you have gone through. Many times you have to repeat yourself when you are trying to tell your story. Because there is nobody who remembers what you have said. But with God it's not so. He is not a forgetful father. 
He is not a forgetful father. He knows the dark days. I remember those dark days crying. Lord, 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 where is this going? What can I what can happen? What can what good can come out of this broken life? What good can come out of this life that is abused? What good can come out of this man that have gone through so much in life? I'm eaten, God. I am chewed. There is nothing in me. There is no more juice in me. There is no more life in me, God. That's why I wanted to end my life. I couldn't see juice. I couldn't see life anymore. I couldn't see that spark or fire in me. But bless God, he saw it. He saw it. He not only saw it. He said, son, I'm going to restore to you all those ears that got eaten from you. I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back. All the health that got deteriorated. All the wealth that has gone. All the abuse that you have done. I'm going to bring it back to you. Yeah. All the abuse you have gone through. All the loss you have gone through. I'm going to bring it back to you. Those things that was done while I was a sinner man. He restored them. If those things that I have acted while I was a sinner, if he restored those things back to me, how much more he will restore back to you when you are walking in the plan of obedience. When you are walking in that plan of righteousness. He knows the pain. He knows the shame. He knows the cry. Oh, you think your life was afflicted. I am here to encourage you and challenge you. There is a glory that is coming into your life that outweighs the affliction. When that glory comes into your life, you better be ready to give him a dance praise, man. I don't know about you. I am all excited to see that because I know the same God that has been faithful to me in restoring my dream is the same God is telling me now I'm going to restore to you everything the locusts have eaten from you. Everything. Everything. And he says that there may be plenty. I'm looking for that. Man. I'm looking for the plenty. Sometimes they're scraping the bottoms is where we live. Oh, barely. Let me get by this thing, Lord. Let me go through this thing, Lord. If only I can go through this day. I don't know about you. There were days I would cry. Help me get through this day, God. This one day. And there are times I cry to the Lord, help me get through this one hour, Lord. My nerves are breaking. My nervous system is crumbling. I can't think straight. I can't talk straight. I can't stand straight. Help me, oh Lord. Give me your grace to walk through this one day, one hour, one moment in my life. And that was the place that I lived. Today I can boldly say, I enjoy my life. I don't know what you see there, but I see the God of restoration work. The God of restoration restoring back to me that which was eaten by locusts. Don't you dare give up on God. It is never too late. Don't you ever say it is a thing in the past. God remembers your tears. God remembers your pain. God remembers your shame. And he says, so that there shall be no more shame. Hallelujah. That is that king that is coming for us. There is that king that is planned for us. There is that king that has set everything for us. We see the traps of the devil. For every trap the devil put, we walk through it. There is a reward that God has promised for us. Maybe we fell in the traps of the devil. Maybe we walked in the trap successfully. It doesn't matter. Irrespective, God is faithful to somebody who is willing to be faithful to him. He wants to restore things back to us. He wants to give those things back to us. Let us all stand to our feet for a minute.
I want us to think about this God, the God of restoration. My prayer today is that the hope that we have in us is rekindled. I want that hope to be rekindled. I want every one of us to stop thinking for any reason that this is a lost cause. <clears throat> the tears that you shed are very important for him. I want to read this thing again as I end in the book of Joel, second chapter. <coughs> Where he said this thing. And the threshing floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you God is taking that responsibility on him. We don't have to do that. It is his responsibility to do that. All he wants us to believe in him. Believe that he can do that for us. Believe that he is doing that for us. This would be the things, the years that we have gone through some abuse. God here clearly says, I'm going to restore them back. If I was somebody who have gone through the abuse, I would want to test him. I would want to test him now. I want to test him to see, to see these ears being restored to me. I will restore to you the ears that the swarming locusts have eaten, has eaten. The crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts. He's going to give everything back to us. Every ounce of it. He knows what was taken away from us. He wants that to be restored back. My dear brothers and sisters, today it is time to see the God of restoration. The God of restoration in action. I'm firmly believing that God will restore for us the CFC. Whatever the locusts have eaten, the swarming locusts, the chewing locusts, the consuming locusts, those locusts that have eaten from us, that which is the fruit of us, that which is supposed to be bringing glory to God, will be restored back to us. I might declare this boldly a restoration of 104. Can somebody agree with me? Yeah. Hundredfold restoration, that which was eaten from us. Starting now, starting today. God, I'm counting on you, Lord. For your plan of restoration for us. For your plan of restoration for us individually. For your plan of restoration for us as Covenant Fusion Church. will be restored back to us hundredfold. Lord. May it be restored back to us hundredfold. You know what has happened to us, God. You know the injustice that we gone through. You know the pain that we have gone through. You know the shame that we have gone through. God, we humbly bow before you for you to restore us. Restore back to us what belongs to us and some. We exalt you today, the Lord of restoration. Show yourself on our behalf. Show yourself on our behalf individually, my God. And in the church. Your name be exalted. Your will be fulfilled in our lives. And your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. We ask this in the mighty and the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all the saints said, Amen. 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 God bless you.